My company is self-funded. I think that's very important. I'm not up here just gonna tell you what you should be doing. Every single thing I'm advising you to do to thrive as a self-funded plan, we use our employees as, and I'm one of the employees on the plan. My family's on the plan. My mom's on my plan. My stepfather works at our, our, at our company. My cousins work at our, everybody in my family works at FIAT, basically. Um, but they're all on our plan. So we try everything out on our employees first before we go out to the industry and tell you to try it. So the stuff that I'm doing, that I'm gonna share with you today are things that we've already done and we've been able to send, uh, save tremendous amounts of money by doing so. So I think that's important to, to say. So with that, let's get this thing started. Okay, these are the things I wanna talk about. We just saw a video, okay? That documentary film, the, the, the trailer for that. Folks, there are more and more of these type of films, these types of articles. You have the Time Magazine article, I believe, in your, in your handouts as well. This stuff didn't happen five, 10 years ago. It was the other way. You were the bad guys. The insurance companies were the bad people, not necessarily looking at the cost of care, but why isn't the health insurance company just paying these particular claims? So the Michael Moore era sort of has ended in regards to a movie like he did, like Sicko. It's really changed the game. We're gonna talk about the cost concerns in the media. We're gonna talk about self-funding in a vacuum. We're gonna talk a little bit about Papaka. I'm not gonna bore you. Trust me, I, every time I speak, I try to pretend that my friends are in the audience and that they'd wanna listen. So I am not gonna bore you with all these rules and regulations. If you want, you can call me up. I can go over each one of them. But we're gonna to touch on it a little bit because it really ties into what's happened in my home state. Anybody here from Massachusetts? Anybody? I know you are, Chris, you work for me. Anybody else? <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, unbelievable, all right, I'm, let me get back on my, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, we're gonna talk about my state because what's happened in my state, you'll, you'll realize, is really a blueprint of what's gonna happen to all of you, the good and the bad. And lastly, we're gonna talk about cost containment options through self-funding and why, in my opinion, this is a great time for the self-funded industry. I know a lot of people out there have you know, doom and gloom uh, when it comes to Papaka, but I look at it very simply. I'm, I get to compete against the government, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think there's a lot of opportunities when you're competing against the government. I mean, you look at Medicare, Medicaid, all the fraud and abuse that you've seen. I think this is an opportunity. The past couple years have been an opportunity for this industry, the self-funded industry, to thrive. And how do I know it's thriving? Is because all the big carriers out there, we call them the Bukas, the Blue Cross, United, Cygnus, and Aetna's, they all want to get into the game as well, more and more and more. I'm sure Cyprus now is competing with these organizations that five, 10 years ago, they didn't have to compete on certain size groups, but now they are, because they realize that self-funding is the future as well. But there's a problem with that too. When things are going too well, people try to bring you down. It's no different than anybody else in your life. You get to the top, there's only one way, place to go, down. And I think that might, is a possibility as well when it comes to the self-funded space. So we'll touch base on that. And lastly, like I mentioned, cost containment. There are many things that you can do. Some of the stuff you're already doing, for example, we already work with Cypress on a lot of subrogation matters, as well as our plan drafting aspects of it. But we're gonna share a bunch of things that you, brokers, employers, stop loss carriers, might wanna look at um, as possible ways to save some additional funds. Okay, you guys have this article. This article is amazing. There's only one problem with this article. Anybody want to tell me what the problem is? Anybody want to raise their hand? I like to call people. Excuse me? It's too long. It's too long. She's exactly right. It's like 40 pages. It's way too long. That's, probably, that's, that's the biggest problem with it. But what it does talk about is the fact how much the cost of care has risen. It's almost ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And what's, what's, what you realize is finally, and the Time Magazine article made a big point of it. The focus is finally on the cost of care, not just access to care and who's gonna pay for something. That's always been the focus in the past. We're finally looking at, hey, why in the world does this cost so much anyways? Because if we realize something, and the state of Massachusetts has realized this as well, if you lower the cost of care of something, you can get more access to it. It's the same reason why more, there are more Toyota Corollas sold than Ferraris because one's cheaper than the other. I'm sure if Ferraris cost $15,000, there'd be a bunch of those on the road as well. So the cost of care ties directly to access of care, and I can tell you that it took six years, but my state finally figured that out as well. Okay, so what do we know? 
Here's what we know, folks. We know that if you look at these increases, this is what the insurers are saying. These are the insurers, the big ones, are saying about healthcare costs. Specifically, what they're saying about potentially what's gonna happen with the exchanges. Look at California by 2017, 62% increase in costs. 67% in Maryland, 80% in Ohio. In Massachusetts, it's basically doubled in the past six years. So sure, you have a health plan, but the problem is it's getting more and more expensive. Huge claim cost increases, and a big part of this is directly due to Papaka. If you look at hospital bills, and I know Tom, you must have so much data on this uh, for your organization. If you look at the average size of a hospital bill, and every MGU stop loss carrier in this room could probably attest to this, the size of the claims are getting bigger. Much, much bigger. Anybody know why? Anybody? Caution for Medicare is a good one. Anybody else? Why are costs going up so much? You are, who's that? You are a very smart young lady over there. Annual maximums are gone. You, there are no more maximums. You can, they can make you spend as much money as they can. So if they know that you have an endless pocketbook, they can increase those charges. And you'll have to pay for those charges. So you're noticing hospital bills, I, think, I, I forget what's one of the largest bills. I saw a bill recently, $4 million for, for a medical bill. Um, but the number of claims that are over a million dollars compared to even a couple years ago have grown in a huge amount. So the point is, the costs are going up and the regulators, the federal government, and the states really don't know what to do about it. So what does the Obama administration say? Well, basically they ignore this. They do everything they possibly can. Now folks, let me explain something to you. I am not an Obama basher. I think there are many good things about Obamacare. I really do. And Romney care, what we have in Massachusetts, there's really good things about that as well. And, but I need you to understand something. This is not a Democrat or Republican thing, okay? There is no one political party that is for self-funding. If anything, both parties are actually against this entire industry. If you look at it, the Republicans really want a self-pay where every person on their own can purchase health insurance, whether it's vouchers, whether it's whatever, a tax break, you buy health insurance on your own. And many Democrats, and especially extreme liberals, believe in a single payer system, let's say like they have in Spain or in France or in Canada. So neither one is really a proponent of the employer-based system. So don't think that just because you vote Republican or vote Democrat that you're somehow changing how self-funding is being viewed. It's not. The real people who actually want self-funding to grow are private employers themselves, the private industry. That's what's making self-funding work, not any government or political party. So it's important to know. But really what the Obama administration has been doing is cost shifting versus cost reduction. It's very important. When they say, oh, we can reduce the cost of this, well, they just reduce the amount they give to Medicare. Well, if you reduce the amount of reimbursement via Medicare to a hospital, what's that hospital gonna do? They have to cost shift those funds to a private insurer who will be willing to pay more. So nothing is really being done by our current administration or under PAPACA to reduce the cost of healthcare. And how do I know that? That's what I do every day. My job on a daily basis is to deal with PAPACA. And I can tell you folks, there's only one industry that's making money right now on healthcare reform, and that's the legal industry. Lawyers are making a lot of money on PAPACA. Not employees, not employers, nobody's saving any money, nothing good. If you look at the amount of billions and millions and billions of dollars that have been wasted on healthcare reform things, such as SBCs. Everybody here know what an SBC is? Raise your hand. Okay, we have in my office 19 people that do SBCs all day long, 19. Okay, 19 people. So SBCs for my company, for me, it's a good thing. Right? I mean, I, people get jobs. We've hired people because of SBCs. Folks, it's the biggest waste of money you could possibly imagine. Now, the idea behind the SBC was a great one. It makes sense. You, sir, and you, sir, you're looking for a plan. You're not sure which plan to pick. Neither one of you are very bright. You know, you're not that smart. <laughs> you can't really read a 90-page document. So what do I do for you guys? Hey, let me figure this out. Let me make a four page document. I'm gonna color code it. I'm gonna put the name of the plan in, every, in the same exact spot in every plan. So when you're comparing things, you can look at things in the same spot. The font's like 29. You can really read it. It's at a third grade reading level. Everything's there. But the problem is, you can't put a summary of a 90 page document, by the way, which is a summary of the plan, the 90 page document, into four pages. 
So what do they say? Oh, we didn't mean four pages. We meant four pages double-sided. So it's eight pages. Oh, you can't fit that in eight pages? Oh, well, do your best. Do the best you can. Make a reasonable effort to try to get it there. Well, sir, our plan isn't a typical Blue Cross plan. We have carve-outs. We have different deductibles for different things. We have transplant networks. Oh, you do? We didn't think of any of those things. Why? Because when they designed these SBCs, they never actually took into account any self-funded plan at all. They only met with all the large insurers who offer fully insured plans. So what has an SBC become? An SBC has become an example of coverage. It even says right on the top, this is just an example. If you really want to know what's covered in your plan, guess what? Read the plan. The amount of money spent by every employer and, you know, et cetera, the, the staff and, and the TPAs, you're looking at over $2,000 per plan on average. I know none of you are paying that because most of the bookers out there offer this stuff for free, but trust me, you're paying that through premium on the fully insured side. This is a huge, huge expense, and I have 19 people to thank the government for having jobs just to make them, and it's a complete waste of money. And that's one example of something that was a good idea, but just went the wrong way. So again, cost shifting versus reducing costs entirely. We're gonna talk about self-funding. Employee benefits are appreciated. Why self-funding has always been a good idea and what self-funding is by the numbers when it comes to Papaka. So one of the key things I think that you need to know, how many, can you raise a hand, how many employers in here? Just employers? All right, good. How many of you employers out here have actually picked up the phone or wrote a letter to one of your congressmen or state reps or whatever in regards to your self-funded plan. All right, Tom. You're like Chris. Don't please. <laughs> one? One? One person. Folks, the problem is I speak in front of the Department of Labor. I go to the Treasury Department. I've gone to the IRS. I've met with HHS. I've met with Ted Kennedy Jr., okay? They don't want to hear from guys like me. They want to hear from you. Because what you say matters. What I say doesn't mean as much. Even though I'm a self-funded plan, they still know I'm also a vendor, an expert, an administrator, just like Tom's company is. You know, Tom might be self-funded in his plan, but he's still a TPA. They want to hear from employers on the ground as to why this is good for our country. And not enough employers are doing it. So I urge any of you, please, a quick one paragraph email to your reps, senators, et cetera, explaining why self-funding has been a good experience so far for you. So, why did they start providing benefits in the first place? Anybody want to take a guess? I have no gifts to give away, okay? I I'm not doing a magic act. I just need, anybody wants to volunteer to show how smart you are in front of all the other people, that'd be great. Can someone tell me why they started offering employee health benefits in the first place? When did it all happen? It was, uh, we should raise your hand, ma'am. <laughs> did you hear me speak before? Can I show of hands who's heard me speak before? All right, so I can use a lot of my old jokes again. Awesome. I'm going to do, I'm going to do the Kelly SPD. I'm sorry. Thanks, Tom. Tom, I know you've heard it 16 times, but they haven't. World War II. Exactly right. When the, when the soldiers came back, the employers needed to find a way to get them to want to work for them. So they offered health benefits. It's an incentive. It's a benefit. It's no different than 401k or a vacation day. So can someone tell me, Business Insurance did a recent survey, what percentage of employers stated they're going to keep their employee benefit plans on after the exchanges started in 2014? Raise your hand, please. Yes. 80? Close. Higher than that. Yes. 86. 86% 86 of employers said they're going to still offer health employee, uh, employee benefits to their employees after the pack up. Can someone tell me in the state of Massachusetts what, percent of, what percentage of employers in my state after we came up with the exchange in 2006, by the way, what percentage of employers in my state kept their employee benefits programs for health benefits? Anybody? How much? 98? Exactly. Wow, I'm impressed. You've definitely heard me. 98% of employers in my state kept their employee benefits, health benefits for their employees, even though they were able to offer a state exchange which would have cost them roughly $2,000 per year per employee. 98% kept their employee benefits. So it's a, it's a very important number for you to think about. Can someone tell me, when they did the survey in Business Insurance Magazine, why, what was the number one reason why the employers decided, why the 86% of employers decided to keep 
offering health benefits to the employees. Yes? Loyalty. Number one reason was loyalty. Number two reason. Anybody? I'll tell you. Retention. They don't want to lose them. Why? You have 100 employees in your office. You're offering them health benefits. You offer a 401k plan. You have a profit sharing plan, whatever it might be. And you tell them, okay, yeah, yeah, we're going to put you in the exchange. The company right down the road will take those employees and offer them a health benefit plan, a private one, and they'll go there. So number one is loyalty, great answer. Number two, retention. So I think the idea of this mass exodus to the exchanges is a little overblown, but as you're gonna see later on, it might not be a good thing that the exchanges don't work. And I'm gonna give you a little secret. In my opinion, we want the exchanges to work. And I'm gonna to explain to you a little bit later why. So we'll go with that. So your option basically is to continue offering benefits or stop offering benefits, allow your employees to go to the exchanges, pay the penalties, and then see what happens. Let me give you an example. My sister lives in Barcelona, Spain. If anybody's ever, never been to Barcelona, I would advise you it's probably the best place I've ever been in my life, by far. It's, the, it's, it's a beautiful city. So she's been living there now for 10 years. She got a great job there, etc. She is a citizen now of Spain, okay, and America. And she has access to public health care. Do you think my sister has ever accessed the public health care system in Spain? Never. Do you think any of her friends, her fiance, all his friends, everybody else, has ever accessed the public health care system in Spain? No, they'd all be dead by now. <laughs> Let me give you the example. My sister, I was there this summer with my wife, was hurt. We were playing soccer, okay? What well, they call football. We were playing soccer, and she sprained her ankle. This is my sister's health plan. Hi, yes, um, can I come in? I just sprained my ankle, thank you. Went to the doctor, saw the doctor, 20 minutes later, done. That's private health care in Spain. So when I say we want to compete with the federal government, I'm telling you that we want to compete with the federal government because the bottom line fact is, the health care system in Spain, the private one, is probably better than anything that I've ever seen here. Because we haven't had to elevate ourselves to a level where we need to be better than some other thing. And like, just like that video attested to, she has 24 hour access to a doctor, 24 hour access to a nurse. She can just walk right into the hospital. The hospital, probably the nicest hospital I've ever seen. I've never been to a hospital this nice. And that's because they're competing against the public healthcare system in Spain, where if you walk in, you realize you just wanna walk right out. So it's important that we, we think about that. So when we look at these two options that employers have, it's gonna be really vital for you to think about what really is gonna happen potentially in the future. Now, I wanna get into this a little bit. I love self-funding. Folks, I'm a huge advocate. My company, obviously, we offer our services, our cost containment services to anybody that pays claims. I don't care if you're Blue Cross. I'll still scrub your data, identify fraud, work on your several files. But anybody that knows me knows that my number one passion is the self-funded industry. That is my goal, that's my expertise, that's all I know, that's all I've ever done. When I was 14 years old, I got a job at a law firm who represented self-funded plans. I've never done anything else. I couldn't write your will, I couldn't handle your personal injury claim. I have no idea how to do any of those things. But when it comes to plans, design, or cost containment on self-funding, that's my niche. And folks, there are certain things that you can do, and brokers in the room, you need to listen, there are certain things that you can do for your clients that you can't do in a fully insured world. And I got a few of them here, obviously. The biggest, the most important, the two most important ones to me would be access to the claims data and the control of the plan design. Let me explain what I mean. In my office, I look at our claims data every week. I share our claims data with my senior VPs every week. We have an actuary look at our claims data every year. By looking at your claims data, you can actually identify your risk. Where are you going bad? Where are your risk points? Do you have too many people with high, high, you know, uh, high blood pressure? Do you have too many obese people? Do you have too many people with diabetes? What is the actual, what's going on with your plan? What's the demographic of your actual employee benefit plan? The only way you can do that is by looking at your claims data. So how you design your wellness plan should be based on what your claims data says. For example, wellness. I love doing wellness conferences, okay? I go to so many wellness conferences, my favorite ones are where everyone's talking about wellness, 
and there's a breakfast buffet, and it's sausage, bacon, eggs, bagels, waffles. I'm like, this is a wellness conference, and they're serving bagels. I mean, they're serving bacon and sausages. Doesn't make any sense to me. The key thing to wellness is wellness needs to be more than just a poster next to the vending machine that says, don't eat this. <laughs> you need to do more than that. One of the things that we do at our company is based on our claims data, we realized we had one, too many people that smoked, and two, we had too many people that just weren't in shape. So we, what do we do? We brought Weight Watchers into FIA. We paid for the whole thing. We lost 650 pounds in the first three months at FIA. 650 pounds were lost. And then we redid it again for the next three months. We incentivized people to lose weight. We incentivized people to get healthy. We gave everyone pedometers to walk around at lunchtime, take a walk, leave the office, go walk around a little bit, come back in. Why? We realized that healthy people come to work. Healthy people are productive. Sick people that come to work get other people sick. And because we're a self-funded plan, we get two benefits out of it. One, they're more productive, but two, our healthcare costs have gone down. Folks, we have not had a premium increase in our office in three years, not one, because of the different things that we do, and tie it directly to access to the claims data. Second most important thing, and until last year, I think this was a major problem in our industry. Until last year, probably most of you never looked at your plan doc. The only reason why most people looked at their plan document last year is because they had to, because you have to make changes to it. You have to decide whether you want to be a grandfather plan. I love that word, grandfather. Grandfather now is a verb, <laughs> right? It's pretty cool. But you know, you're a grandfather plan, non -grand all these new benefits, et cetera, essential health benefits. I don't know what that is, actually, but maybe what somebody here does. But the point is, you never look at your plan. Your number one biggest benefit of being a self-funded plan is that you can custom design what benefits you want to offer to your employees. A school district in California for teachers should not have the same benefits at a, as a bunch of truck drivers in New Jersey or offshore drillers in New Orleans. The point is every single plan has to be different and how you, what you write in your plan needs to be catered to what your company does. And that's the innovative part. When you look at Blue Cross, for example, of whatever, Massachusetts, here's your option. You can have the bronze plan, the silver plan, or the gold plan. The language is the same. What's different? The co-pays, the premium. That's it. That's the difference. You have the ability to say, you know what? I want to cover acupuncture. So what do we do? We cover acupuncture. 100%, no co-pays. Why? I was sick of my people using so many drugs. You saw the video with the army guy. Right? I had a friend, I, I, sorry for sharing a, uh, I'm sorry for sharing a story. When I was 25 years old, my best friend died from heroin. When I was 25. I grew up in Dorchester. And maybe you don't know what Dorchester is, but you probably do now. Dorchester is with that little boy, the eight-year-old boy. Martin died from the Boston Marathon bombings. That's my same, I'm from the same neighborhood. I went to the same uh, elementary school as, as he did. So what I could tell you is, you know, the bottom line is he got in a car accident, got put on, Percocets, then Oxycontin, got hooked on Oxycontin, then Oxycontin pres uh, prescription ran out, and he started buying Oxycontin. Oxycontin cost $20 a pill, so what was he told? Hey, if you do heroin, it's $3 instead of $20, start doing heroin. Started doing heroin, died six months later. So the reason I tell that story is for you to all realize that drugs aren't necessarily good. I know we have a, we're going to be doing an RX presentation after this, but there are also other alternatives that you, that you can look at. One of them is, obviously, like I just mentioned, acupuncture. We cover it 100% of my office. There's a lot of different things you could do when it comes to your plan design, and I'm going to get into those in a little bit. But as you can see here, and it's really important to know, 68% of large firms utilize self-funding, 65% of employers are looking at self-funding, for their employees. So it's definitely something that has a huge growth, has huge growth potential, but it's important that you brokers in here don't just start offering self-funded plans to your employer groups, your clients, because you hear it's, it's the word of the day. It's also important how you design it. I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail. So you wanna make sure you obviously design your plan to your employee population. You wanna look at wellness. Wellness, the one good thing about healthcare reform is that they've, I, they, they've targeted wellness big time how much you can incentivize under wellness. People have even taken it so far, again, I wouldn't recommend this necessarily, but there's been a couple court cases already that have said that if you want to pre-screen people before they start working for you, 
whether or not they will A, give you a BMI. What's their body mass index? Two, do you smoke? Take an exam, take a blood test to prove that you don't smoke or do drugs. Those kinds of things now are being allowed by employers before they actually hire an employee. I mean, these are the kind of things that we're starting to see. And based on what we're seeing in Papaka, a lot of this stuff is being allowed because Papaka does have a huge double the incentive for employers to try to get their employees to become healthy to reduce the cost of care. What else can you do? Alternative cost mechanisms, cost plus, UNC. I'm going to get into the whole UNC argument in a little bit. Also, you want to look at subrogation matters. Luckily for you, the ones that work with Cypress, you work with us on. And lastly, fraud detection. Let me talk about subrogation really quickly. You might think it's boring. It's funny. I'll tell you a quick story. I know these stories are probably killing me here on time, but let me just tell you a quick story. My mom is, a, I'm first generation in this country. My mom is, was born in Poland. I speak fluent Polish. I know you, I look Italian. I know, I get it. My last name's Russo, not Pekorski. I understand that. <laughs> but I speak fluent Polish. I write Polish. I went to Polish school, dated Polish girls my entire life. because they were all, It was great dating Polish girls because they all had six month visas. <laughs> so they always had to go back. <laughs> it was the greatest thing I ever done. Was like, oh, you gotta go back? Oh, it's too bad. <laughs> Just waiting for the next plane to come in. Um, but the reason I bring it up is my mom, you know, she's obviously, you know, she's proud of me. I went to college and, you know, all that. I started my own business. But she never really understood what I did. So one night she worked at a, as a nurse's aide. My mom was a nurse's aide, worked three jobs, Dunkin' Donuts, you name it, just to help us out. And she went to, she worked in the inner city in Dorchester at a, at a local community hospital. And she worked with most of the people that she worked with weren't white. They were, you know, Haitians or black, et cetera. So she went to work one night and told us to all her coworkers, my son is the best segregation lawyer in the country. <laughs> she comes to home the next day and she goes, Adam, she's like, you told me that you would do segregation, right? I'm like, no, subrogation, ma, not segregation, it's subrogation. I can't, I can't even imagine what that must have been like, but I hope she explained it the next day. But the reason I bring it up is there was a huge case that just came out recently in the Supreme Court of the United States, which I was lucky to be a part of. It was called U.S. Airways v. McCutcheon. And it literally just happened, what, a couple months ago, Chris? I knew I had you here for a reason. Well, the reason, the reason this case is so important is what the court said was the U.S. Airways won. They were able to recover the money for their employee. But the court said specifically, you have to look at what the plain language says. Their plan language in the U.S. Airways Employee Benefit Plan did not, re did not disclaim the, the attorney's fees, the common fund doctrine, which means any settlement, any reimbursement for the plan could be reduced by the attorney's attorney's fees. So if you were owed $100,000 on your plan, they could, only give you, they could actually give you $67,000. If they had our language in it, they would have recovered all the money because our plan language does disclaim the common fund doctrine and the made whole rule. So now it's more important than ever, look at your plans, look at the plan design, look at your subrogation section, and see what it specifically says in regards to reductions for attorney's fees and eliminating your right under made whole. Because the Supreme Court just said in April that that matters. And trust me folks, when you have a $500,000 claim and instead of getting a half a million dollars, you're getting $250,000 back, it's a big difference. Especially you stop loss carriers in the room when you're dealing with the larger claims. Important to know. In addition, UNC, I'm gonna bring this, this story up. I always like to bring up the story. UCNR, anybody know what that is? Just tell me if you know. Usually, customary, and reasonable. Perfect, usual, customary, reasonable. Remember those words. My best friend is named Robert Witterowski. Yes, he's Polish. Okay, I grew up in a Polish neighborhood. So we call him Wiki. Wiki owns a garage. He's a mechanic. There's three garages in this town of Topsfield, Massachusetts, okay, which is just north of the city of Boston. Three of them. Every couple months, these three guys, the three owners, get together, and what do they do? They price fix. That's what they do. No different than the hospitals do, or anybody else. They price fix. They go, all right, what, do you want to, what are you gonna charge for an oil change? Okay, what are you charging for towing? What are you gonna charge to get the inspection sticker done? All right, what are you gonna do for transmissions? That's what they do. So. Usual, customary, reasonable. Just because Wiki usually charges 50 bucks for an oil change, and just because he's been doing it to you and your family for 20 years makes it customary, right? 
He's been ripping you off for years now. Okay? So just because something is usual, and just because something is a customary thing, does that make it right? Does that make it reasonable? However, most plans out here, out there, language in their plan document, when they decide what they should pay for a claim, says usual, customary, and reasonable. Doesn't make any sense. Reasonableness should not be tied to being usual and customary. Luckily for you folks, you work with Cyprus, they have innovative plan language that actually ties what they should pay based on other more important methodologies, such as what did it actually cost? Does it actually make sense to charge this much? Just because everyone charges this much in this particular area or zip code, et cetera, doesn't mean it's right. And that's important for all of you to understand. Know that you have to look at your plan language and design, put language in there and design aspects in there, not just from a compliance standpoint. That's easy. Any lawyer in the country can write you a plan document to be in compliance with healthcare reform. Not a problem. You need to have language in the plan that will also look at how much you're actually spending. I call it my wife's shopping plan document. Okay, let me give you an example. Okay? My wife, when I go on the road, she likes to spend my money. She goes shopping. Makes sense. So I create a shopping plan document for my wife. Okay? <laughs> SPD. Okay. So everyone here knows what their exclusion section say in their plan? If you say you do, you're lying. You have no idea what it says in your exclusion section. But that's fine. We'll pretend you do. Well, in my wife's shopping, how much time do I have, Chris? 20 minutes. Oh, I'm done. I'm screwed. Sorry. I can keep going. All right, gonna, we, we can skip the next guy. So, I mean, really? All right. I'm not even kidding. Um, I'm going to Whoever the next guy is, I apologize. I'll buy you a drink after this. Kelly shopping plan document. Exclusions. Let's say my wife's plan document for shopping says it excludes high-priced um, women's wear. Okay? She goes to like, high price shop, I don't know, like a high end fashion. Excludes high end fashion. Nordstrom's. Is that excluded? No, I think it is. You don't think it is? Okay. Okay. Barney's. Obviously excluded, right? All right, Barney's. Okay, good. How about Macy's? All the women are saying no, but I'm like, yeah, that's high end. Now, Walmart, no copay, no deductible. Spend as much money as you want. Take, go there, have a shopping spree. Do whatever you want at Walmart. You want to go to TJ Maxx, Marshalls? Have a good time. But Bloomingdale's, is that high-end fashion? It's getting there. But see, the point is, what's the problem? What is the point of what I'm trying to say? Ambiguity, too broad. You want to specifically say in your plan what's covered and what's not. And the problem is, for most broke people, most self-funded plans, you're your own worst enemy. Your exclusions are so vague, they don't make any sense, that if I'm a TPA, many times I have no idea what it is you're trying to tell me. Your job as the plan is, it's your money. This is not Cyprus's money, it's your money. You need to decide, this is what's covered, this is what's not covered. This is what I'm willing to pay and how I'm willing to pay it. And all they're supposed to do is follow your lead. Now I understand that you want them to be the experts and they should give you the advice as to here's what is customary in our industry, here's what we think works best, here are best practices. But the reality is at the end of the day, you need to decide if Macy's is covered or not. It's your decision under illegal acts, all these things. So it's really important that all of you understand how important it is to design that particular plan. Okay, Papaka, not gonna spend too much time on this. I really don't want to. I want to tell you a couple of things though, and it's really important. This gentleman, Timothy Jost, and also Mark Hall, and I know Fred talked about sham self-insurance. Here's the bottom line. They don't want any of us to be in business. None of us. They want to get rid of our entire industry. Fact. How do I know? I talk to Mark Hall all the time. He's a friend of mine. We have just heated discussions all the time about this stuff. They want to eliminate the ability to self-fund. Now, how do you eliminate the ability to self-fund? I'm just going to go over this right here. There's two ways to eliminate self-funding. One is to actually change ERISA, which is set up in 1974. Okay? To get rid of ERISA is a lot of work. Congress, etc. You have to change the law. Very different. Difficult to do. 
What's the easiest way to get my company to no longer be self-funded? Yeah? Stop loss. I keep hearing the word stop loss. Basic. My stop loss spec deductible is $50,000 at my company. 50, five zero. If the rule was I had to buy it at 100, I would not be self-funded anymore. It's pretty simple. It doesn't matter how well my plan's designed. It doesn't matter how great my data is. It doesn't matter that all I eat is yogurt and work out all day and run mountains. The fact of the matter is I would be petrified to have a spec of $100,000. I could not do it. And they know that. So when I say, folks, that that is the beast in the room, that is that ghost, that, that is that 10,000 pound gorilla in the corner, anyone that tells you it's not a big deal is lying to you. This is a major, major, major problem. And here's why. These states that I gave here, when I gave these slides to Cyprus about a month ago, this was current. This is old. Don't even look at this. Okay? Let me give you some names, some states. California, Minnesota, Rhode Island. See how this bill stalled? Those bills ain't stalled. Idaho, North Carolina. Where else? Colorado. These states, and I know that Tom talked about it earlier in regards to how the State Insurance Commission will be able to change the rules as they see fit going forward. That, my friends, is the scariest part of this whole thing. And let me explain to you why. And this is why when I mentioned earlier, remember, remember I said, remember this? When I said you want the exchanges to work a little? Here's why. Let's say I'm in North Carolina. I have a $50,000, I say, okay, we're gonna make this $65,000 spec deductible, okay. And it's for 50 lives and less, okay. And now I have my exchange. I'm in year one of the exchange and I'm getting my butt whipped. My costs are skyrocketing. The only people joining the exchange are like alcoholics, okay? I got guys, 400 pound guys, that ride trucks, do meth, and drink whiskey. That's my exchange, that's the population. My costs are through the roof. All these self-funded plans, you know, North Carolina, they're all working out, the young companies, these IT firms, you know, all these young people, and they're on these self-funded plans and the costs are low and they have innovative plan design and they cover yoga, you know, all these really innovative things and the costs are going way down. That's not a good thing for us. Because what are they gonna say? How do we get these people into these exchanges? They can't force you, they can't make you, we don't have a single payer system, but how can they do it? All the insurance commission has to do is say, okay, let's make that 65, 250. Let's make that 50 lives, 250 lives. And it might take a year or two or three, but the point is, it's an easy, the easiest way to get my company to the exchange is by limiting my ability to purchase stop loss. And that is not an ERISA issue. People believe that there's a, there's a superhero called ERISA man, okay? That like flies down from the heavens that could save you. The number of times I talk to, I, I represent six and a half million employee lives, folks. And the number of times I've heard the words, but we are an ERISA plan. I don't care that you're an ERISA plan. This has nothing to do with ERISA. Stop loss is governed by state law, not federal. They are not ERISA plans. Your self-funded plan is an ERISA plan, but stop loss is not. So the point is, they know that they attack stop loss, reduce the ability to purchase stop loss, and what's gonna happen? They will get more and more lives to those exchanges. So if these exchanges bomb, it's bad for us. We almost want to do pretty good, like okay, just to allow both systems to be in place. Because I can tell you, if the exchanges don't work, they're gonna come after us. And I can tell you why, how do I know this? It's happened in these states. Every single week, I get a new bulletin about another state, Utah. Basic, it already has the governor's signature. Basically, it's eliminated stop loss potential in the entire state of Utah. How? Let me explain why. In Utah, what they have put in there is basically, you write that second tab under Utah, stop loss to pay claims incurred but not reported if plan terminates. Stop loss carrier paying claims. First dollar, claims. Great, 10 minutes. First dollar. What are they trying to do in Utah? The stop loss industry and all of us always say, what? Stop loss isn't health insurance. Why? We're a liability. It's liability insurance. We're, you know, we're not actually paying claims. In Utah, they're setting this up so that it's almost as if a stop loss carrier is a health insurer. And if stop loss carrier is a health insurer, they cannot put PPECE regulations on them. 
I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory, folks, but anyone that's heard me speak for the past couple years knows that pretty much I've been right on what they're gonna do. And they started in California and it's spreading like wildfire. And if you look at these states, Colorado, Utah, are those democratic states? Colorado? Well, compared to Massachusetts, they might as well be, come on. I'm in, a, I'm in a communist state of Massachusetts, guys. Let's, let's, let's do a comparison here, folks, okay? You like that little graphic? That's the only graphic you're gonna see with me. Okay, so Massachusetts, I got 10 minutes. I can make this happen. Massachusetts is the blueprint of the future. How do I know this? Folks, my wife is an artist, okay? She's an art teacher. She, I go to more museums than you could ever want. I go to museums twice sometimes, okay? Trust me, it's suicidal, but I do it. When you see a Van Gogh, okay, yeah, you know, they're different, but you can tell that it's a Van Gogh. You can tell, you know, all right, you can t figure out who, which artist it is. The Massachusetts plan and the national plan have the same architect. It's the same artist. There's little differences, but Romney Care and Obamacare is pretty much the same thing, okay? So I'm gonna use the state of Massachusetts as an example of what's gonna happen for the rest of the country, and it's pretty, Interesting, what's gonna happen? So like I said, 2% only left. So what happened? In my state, and this number just came out last week, what is our goal? And Governor Romney said this, and Deval Patrick, who's also gonna run for president next, you'll see. What did they say? They both agreed that the state made a mistake because all they focused on was getting everyone health care, everyone health insurance. But they didn't focus on the cost of the insurance the cost of the care. They didn't put any emphasis on that. So one thing that we did, which I'm very proud of, is we were able to reduce the uninsured population from 11% to 6.3 until 2010. Folks, today it's 3%. Think about it, in my little state, we went from 11% to 3%. Texas, by the way, is 25, and a lot bigger, okay? If you look at what's happened in our state, though, all these mandates got put in. Essential health benefits. How did it happen? Well, 2007 came and politicians are running for office. The Massachusetts Chiropractor Association. Hey, we'll give you a nice little chunk of money. We'll give you a half million dollars for your campaign. Hey, but we want chiropractic care covered 100%. Unlimited benefits in the Massachusetts Connector Plan. Okay, it's in there. All these benefits started getting thrown in. So what happened was the cost of the actual plan, folks, when I say Cadillac plan, forget Cadillacs. It's a Ferrari plan. We have more benefits in the Massachusetts Connector Plan than you could ever imagine. So all these benefits are in there, but what did the state tell the insurers? You can't charge higher premium. So what did the insurers do? They sued the state to increase the premiums. They said, we're losing money. We can't stay in business. We can't offer all these benefits and not increase the premium. But why did the state not increase the premiums? Because the governor would have lost his job if they increased those premiums and raised taxes. So what happened was, just like with this Ferrari, everyone's heard this before, if you're happy with your health insurance, you can keep it, right? Everyone's heard this. Okay, this side of the room, you guys all have cars, I'm assuming? All right, what kind of car do you drive, sir? I'm sorry. A Jeep. A Jeep. What do you have, ma'am? Avalanche. Avalanche, yep. What? A Rogue. A Rogue? I don't, I don't know what that is. Yes? <laughs> a Toyota. All right, I'm looking for some Toyota. Are there any Toyota people on this side? Not this side, guys. This side? Okay, I'm gonna pretend there's a lot of Toyota people here, okay? You guys are all too rich for me. Okay, if you have your Toyota, if you're happy with your Toyota, you keep that Toyota. No problem. You guys, what do I do? Ah, uh, who cares? You guys, I don't, I don't need this. You folks, you know what? You all have bicycles. You walk to work. Listen, even though they have Toyotas, you don't need a Toyota. I'm gonna give you all Ferraris. You need a way to get to work. And why am I gonna give you a crappy little Toyota? I'm gonna give you a Ferrari. So everyone on this side of the room, you have Ferraris in my state. But guess what you can do? You can wash that Ferrari, you can wax that Ferrari, you can take pictures of you sitting in that Ferrari, put it on Facebook, Twitter, shows your friends, but guess what you don't have? Keys. <laughs> and that's what happened in my state. In my state, what's happened is everyone has an insurance card. 97% of people have an insurance card, but they can't get access to healthcare. Just because you have a card, doesn't mean you get care. So what happened is in our state, those people in the connector plan, because it's state run, 
are having a much harder time getting a doctor's appointment. So what are they doing? They're going back to the emergency room that they went to in the first place, which caused the cost, which, which caused the cost of the care to go up in the first place. The reason we did this whole thing is to get people out of the emergency rooms. And now they're going back. Because when they did a study, if I have Blue Cross Blue Shield, I can get an appointment in two weeks. If I have Medicare in my state, I can get an appointment in a month. If I have Medicaid in my state, I can get an appointment in six weeks. If I have the connector plan, it takes three months to get an appointment. Because the doctors don't want to see you. You have the card, you don't have the keys. So think about that. So what do we finally do in my state? We finally, in 2010, look what happened in 2010. Folks, 2006 has started. I'm sorry I get so excited about this, but this is crazy. 2006, we start the exchange. 2010, the government of my state finally investigates, and what do they find? Oh my God. Why is it that this one hospital over here charges this much, and the other hospital across the street charges three times more for the same procedure? Wait a second, why is there so much fraud? Why is there so much waste? Why is there so much abuse? Four years before they started to investigate why the costs were so high in this plan. And it got so bad that in my democratic state, 98% of our, our government officials are Democrats. In August of 2012, we passed the most expansive cost containment bill ever seen in this country. And why did we do it? Because we were losing $7 billion were wasted in the first six years of our plan. 10.9% down to three, $7 billion wasted. What do you think is gonna happen in Texas? It took six years to pass a cost containment bill. And guess what this cost containment bill says? We need transparency. You gotta, we, now you're gonna be required, every hospital to show what their prices are on a website. We need to show, you have to prove why are you charging double what she charges even though she's a mile away from you. Why is your facility charging so much more for the same procedure than he is? What else are they doing? 182 day cooling off period for medical malpractice cases. Does people, do people know why most medical malpractice cases don't settle? Because a doctor isn't allowed to apologize to the patient. If a doctor apologizes to the patient, it says, hey, I'm sorry I cut off the wrong leg, man. I'm really sorry. If I say that to you, I have admitted guilt. So what they're saying now is, two minutes, what they're saying now is, in my state, if a doctor apologizes to you, you can't use that in the lawsuit. And most people who file lawsuits against hospitals and facilities, all they want, folks, is I'm sorry. That's why a lot of people sue. They want to just be told we screwed up. I know some personal family experience. They just want to be told we screwed up. 182 day cooling off period of all size before a lawsuit can be filed. Why? To reduce the cost of health care. These are the kind of things that we're doing. And the funny thing is, we did all this in August 2012. Six years later, none of this stuff is in Papaka. None of it. So what do I see happening? All the stuff that we just did, and we learned our lesson from six years later, is all going to be happening on a federal level pretty soon, I would, I would think. So what you're seeing, as I mentioned before, is important for you to know about self-funding, people who love self-funding. Look what's happened in my state since 2006. The number of self-insured plans went from 54% to 67% when the exchange came in. Self-funding grew by 13% due to the exchanges. We have the third highest, we're second, though, we're third highest in the country for number of self-funded plans with less than 50 employees in the plan. Third in the country. So if anything, the exchanges and all this stuff should help grow self-funding. Let me show you this right here as a slide. This is self-funding since 1996 to 2011. And you can see what it is on a national level for, for firms with less than 50 employees. It's pretty, pretty much been around 10%, 10, 11, 12%. And look what it is for more than 50 employees, 68% up from 54. So Massachusetts was way lower than the rest of the country when it came to self-funded plans. And since our exchanges started, it's grown. And why? Because you have the ability as a self-funded plan to do what's right for your own employees. And for the brokers in the room, you have, the way, you have an ability to look really smart to your clients, showing them, here's how you can save money. Let me give you some really quick examples. Folks, we do a hybrid approach. What I mean by hybrid approach is pretty much this. Do we have a network? Yes. Do I think networks are horrible? Yes. I'm not a big network guy. I don't like PPOs, clearly, okay? Understood. 
Why? Because all they focus on is discounts. You giving me a 20% discount on something that's been inflated 10,000% isn't a discount, okay? Anybody here that watches those men's warehouse commercials that actually believes you get a suit for free? <laughs> you should probably be with the PPO, it makes sense. <laughs> oh, I buy two suits, I get one free? This is amazing, how do they do that? I don't know, I don't know how they do that. But what I'm trying to say to you folks is, I know why you need networks. It's the same reason why my employees have a network. Why? Because 90% of the claims are doctor's visits, office visits, cheap stuff, small claims, no big deal, $100 claim, $200 claim. You don't need to negotiate those. The claims that you are need to be worried about, and every stop loss care and MGU in this room knows what I'm talking about, are those large hospital bills, dialysis claims, transplant claims. All that stuff is what you need to concern yourself with. So the perfect scenario in a perfect world would be a Physicians only network where you pay and negotiate all large hospitalization in inpatient claims. That's a perfect world. But guess what? There aren't any companies like that. There aren't many. Because most networks would never allow for only be a physician only network. They want to keep those hospitals in there because they need those hospitals in those networks. There's a huge lawsuit going on in California specifically about this as well which I'm not gonna get into right now if you wanna talk about it after I can, which we're a big part of when it comes to fraud. But the key thing is, smaller networks work. Last story, and I'll end. A good friend of mine, Angel, he's Greek. Okay? He works for the subway system in Boston called the T. Basically, that means he doesn't work. <laughs> he doesn't do anything. He like, works out for five hours a day. You know, like, he picks up his kids from school at two, even though he's supposed to be at work till five. It's amazing, it's a great job. I pay for it, it's a great job. But anyways, he called me one day because the state of Massachusetts did an amazing thing. They took all the state employees and said, all right guys, we can't have you with Blue Cross Blue Shield anymore. We can't afford it. Once the state started seeing the cost, it woke up. That's why I think the rest of the country is gonna wake up too, and that's why you see these documentaries. So what happened? He meets with the state, has all these you know, counselors and brokers meet with all the union folks. And he calls me up one day and he swore, I'm not gonna give you the swears he used, but he said, Adam, they're with my benefits. <laughs> I'm like, what, what do you mean? He's like, they're with my benefits, okay? So tell me how they're with your benefits. Well, they're offering me to give me no premium for a year for his four daughters and his wife and himself. No premium, free healthcare for a year. And then next year, his premium would be half the $700 he pays now. Okay, and you're getting screwed how? They gave him a limited network, a narrow network. He couldn't go to any hospital, any doctor that he wanted to. It had to be in his network. Okay, so Angelo, you live in Weymouth, but just south of Boston. Is the hospital that you go to in the network? Yeah. Is your doctor in the network? Yeah, are the kids pediatricians in the network? Yeah. So every single person that you go to is in this network? Yes. Then tell me what the problem is. Nobody explained that to him. The people that were hired to explain this to the, these folks didn't explain it that way. So the point I'm trying to say is very simply this. It's called education. If you educate your employees as to what the plan is and incentivize them for give them a reason to look at the bill, it makes a big difference. In my company, if my employees identify fraud on their bill, half the money recoup goes back to them as cash. In my company, we have direct negotiations with certain providers, Doctors Express, for example. If you go to urgent care at Doctors Express, it's $150 self-pay. If you instead go to the emergency room two miles away, it's a $250 copay on your plan. So we give them no copay to go to Dots Express. Incentivize them to go to Dots Express. Anybody here heard of the uh, Dr. Keats uh, Smith, Oklahoma Surgery Center? Anybody heard of this guy? Domestic tourism. He's the only, he's the, the Oklahoma Surgery Center, it's, he's been on Fox News, everything, CNN, etc. He's the only surgery center in the country that posts their pricing online. You can actually look at what you're going to pay for sh shoulder surgery before you go there. So it's, we do domestic travel. You want to go see Dr. Smith? Okay, we're going to look at the cost for Dr. Smith for that procedure. Based on our claims data, we'll look at the cost of what it would be with your our normal network plan. If there's an over $5,000 savings, we'll give you a third of whatever that is. Back to you, if you go to Oklahoma. By the way, take your wife, first class plane ticket, we'll put you in the four seasons. 
that's how much money we're able to save by doing these kind of things. It's these kind of things that you need to start doing. Think outside the box in order to find ways to save your employees money and to educate them to actually start caring and realize that it's not just a $20 copay that matters, it's actually the entire bill that matters. Just like the stop loss carriers want you employers to finally start caring about, oh, I don't care, I have a $20,000 deductible. What do I care about this $300,000 bill? Because I'm not paying for it. I'm only paying 20 grand. You also need to start caring about that large bill because trust me, next year, your premium for stop loss will not be the same amount and you shouldn't cry about it when it happens. Unless you do something about it too. And luckily for you, you're with a great organization that is doing this on your behalf. But just think about different ways to do it. I appreciate your time. I have a blog, Passion for Several, my website, theagroup.com. If you want any information or you want to listen to any of our webinars, we do monthly webinars free of charge. I'll give you my business card. Thank you very much for the opportunity.